Hello, and welcome to Poetry at the Dolly Museum. I'm Hank Hine, and I'm the Dolly Director, and it's my honor to welcome Helen Pruitt Wallace, the Poet Laureate of St. Petersburg, once again uh, for Poetry at the Dolly. We're reminded of the uh, words of William Carlos Williams when he said, it is difficult to get the news from poetry, but people die every day from lack thereof. And we are going to welcome today with the help of, of the funds from the city of St. Petersburg and our members, uh, we're going to welcome Todd Boss. Todd is avant-garde both in literary and in media terms, and you will be delighted by this presentation. But first, as is our tradition, we're going to ask the Poet Laureate of St. Petersburg to read a poem. Helen? Thank you so much, um, Hank, for that introduction and uh, welcome Todd Boss. We are so very excited to have you here with us again. Um, Todd read for us at the Dolly before and, and hopefully some of you watching this uh, were lucky to hear him um, when he was here a few years ago now, I think. So um, we're so glad to have him back. Um, and thanks always to Hank, Dr. Hank Hine for his support of our poetry program. I will read one short poem. And this is a poem um, I actually wrote years ago for my daughter, but my husband and I are new, brand new um, grandparents. I'm super excited about that. So this is a short poem I'm going to read um, to welcome our new granddaughter. Um, whose name is Sophia Huntington, and the poem is Whole Notes. I remember swearing once that if by luck or by some tender stroke I had a daughter, I'd wipe away the salt from your eyes and show you your own whole notes. Now, as you grope my lacteal body, your tiny hands swiping at my nose, my chin, the gold around my wrist, listen to the voices in my breast as one who hears the sea inside a shell. Believe me when I say you are the swell that breaks upon this world a piercing sound. And now I have the pleasure to introduce Todd Boss. Um, Todd has his hands in so many pies. It's just so exciting to hear um, all the things he's doing. And I, I, he's gonna be um, delighting us by showing us lots of that in, in this evening's program. Um, so thanks to all of you for tuning in and um, you're in for a, for a good evening. Todd is a poet, a public artist, an inventor, a librettist and film producer in Minneapolis. His uh, four poetry collections were all published by W.W. Norton and Company and include Yellow Rocket, Pitch, Tough Luck, and One Day the Plan of a Town forthcoming in 2022. That's exciting, Todd. Um, so happy to know that that's coming down the pike. His poems have appeared in the New Yorker, the American Poetry Review, Poetry and NPR. His lyrics have been performed at the Kennedy Center and Carnegie Hall. His work's been recognized with Grammy nominations and by the National Book Foundation. He's the, he's the founding artistic director of Motion Poems a production company that has turned more than 150 contemporary poems into short films. And we're going to see a couple of those um, poems, films um, this evening with Todd. His large scale public artworks include a building projection, multimedia installations and VR projects. He's the inventor of the laptop strap family of business accessories, which I look forward to hearing about. Um, and he also, and we really have to talk about this. In 2018, sold all of his possessions. And as a two suitcase nomad, he circled the globe on a series of 30 plus consecutive house sits. So um, that's got to be an amazing story, which we look forward to hear um, all about. So welcome, Todd. So glad you could join us this evening. Thank you so much. It's a really sweet to, uh, that's a really, um, it sounds like a really illustrious uh, uh, biography, um, but honestly, I'm just bumbling around doing what comes naturally. Uh, and I look forward to sharing uh, a lot of that. It's nice to be back. Uh, thanks to the Dolly Museum. Thanks, uh, Hank. Thanks, Helen. 
for, for having me back. Uh, I think I'll um, start uh, with an attempt to screen share a poem that opens my next collection that's due out in January from W.W. Norton and Company. It's called Someday the Plan of a Town. The collection um, uh, is uh, all new poetry uh, that I wrote in the last couple of years on my travels as a nomad. Uh, in 2018, I um, quit my lease uh, in Minneapolis. I sold all my belongings my car, my bike, my everything, uh, Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace just got rid of everything I owned except for two suitcases. And um, I've been traveling ever since. Uh, I'm currently in Santa Monica, California, um, but um, my tra travels took me all around the globe uh, uh, on a series of 30 plus house sits, as Helen mentioned. Uh, there's a site for that, it's called trustedhousesitters.com. And that's where I was able to uh, build up a reputation as a house sitter and um, string one gig after another for about a year and a half until the pandemic came along. I've been renting ever since then in different parts of the US. Uh, I thought I'd start with the first poem in the collection, which is a poem called Where You've Been. And we'll see if we can screen share that. Where you've been, the trouble with telling people where you've been is that then they start telling you where they've been and making it sound like you haven't been anywhere until you've been where they've been. And before you can tell them that where you've been is every bit as interesting as where they've been, they're explaining how to get to where they've been, even though you don't intend to go. And by then, where where you've been has been lost around the bend and you know that they know though nobody says so that no one's going to be going there again. Uh, it's just a little fun uh, introduction to uh, the, the dilemma that's caused by travel. You know, you can really never share uh, where you've been um, comprehensively or satisfactorily uh, to anyone. Um, even if you are able to somehow uh, articulate uh, the special privilege, the special joy of being in a particular place. Um, uh, somehow that articulation is corrupted by uh, other people's experience, other people's understanding, uh, other people's uh, ability to go there with you. Uh, even if you travel with someone, uh, as opposed to traveling solo as I have, um, that person has a very different experience of the same place uh, that you might have. So um, I was trying to get at that with this poem. Uh, the collection uh, is, is beautifully illustrated throughout by a little series of uh, woodcut, uh, rather uh, lino cut um, uh, woodblock uh, type uh, prints. Uh, made by Pam Gerbrandt, uh, who is a Winnipeg Canada, Canada artist. Uh, she looks around uh, her area and she uh, studies maps of small towns. And then she turns those into little uh, linoleum blocks and prints them. She's on Etsy and I discovered her there uh, and decided that they'd make great um, interstitial uh, de uh, decorations for uh, the book. So I wanted to show her work because it's uh, very sweet. Uh, you might see as I scroll through uh, later in the program, uh, they appear periodically. Now you know what those are. Uh, I wanna start with the opening, uh, with the title poem rather of the collection. Uh, again, the collection's called Someday, The Plan of a Town. Someday the plan of a town, right down to its side tracks and back alleyways, will match, or so goes the dream, with some identical patch of neural network your rogue thoughts roam in. Overlay it like those musculoskeletal transparencies with which anatomy textbooks come bound. And you'll be at home in its dog leg joint work of cobbled kinks and your body will resound at every fork 
tuning fork like. And every road you ever rambled will be re-scrambled to appear to have brought you here where you fit so perfectly, where you can practically predict where to find every bench or post box and where you can cue every little old lady who leaves her flat to buy bread as if she were locking up a little room in your head and trading your idea of money for your idea of food before returning to wipe her shoes on the mat, your mind's laid flat and fit her flat key to its shoulder into the strike plate keyhole through which you daily romance her as she grows older. That worn dome topped slot that looks as if two question marks met on the road to kiss and mate and make one question, opening, opening, each forever the other's only answer. I travel, um, I travel like some drink uh, to, be, to be lost. Uh, I like to, um, I don't like to see the sights. I like to live like a local. Um, on house sits, uh, I'm privileged to look after other people's pets more often than not, sometimes even their farms, um, their chickens, their backyard, uh, their backyard ducks. Uh, I've been um, uh, in that position, uh, I've been able to explore uh, the neighborhood as if I really lived there and meet the people who know those pets uh, and uh, incorporate myself into the city just as any pet owner or farm uh, owner might do. Uh, and because there's a dog at home who needs me or because there's a, a little farm uh, to take care of, uh, I had 30 sheep in the Pyrenees. Um, wow. I'm bound to that place in a way that a typical tourist is not. So even though I might have a rental car at my disposal or sometimes the owners will, will let me use theirs, or I might be a block or two from the river ferry or uh, other public transportation. I'm always conscious that there's someone back home that needs me. Uh, so it's a different way of traveling, a different kind of travel. And um, in that mode, uh, I really, um, people ask me all the time, what's your, fav where, what's your favorite place? Where, where did you love uh, to be the most? And I cannot answer that question because uh, when you're needed, in that way, even by uh, a Pekingese, uh, you become uh, rooted in a way that uh, you just don't when you're when you're out, a sort of joy riding or or looking at the sights or experiencing the museums, uh, and um, you, you find you kind of fall in love. You leave a little bit of your heart with that animal. You leave a little bit of yourself with that farm, with that house. Um, with the belongings of that house, with the furniture of that house, the smell of that house, all those things kind of become uh, a part of you for a time. And uh, it's, it's endearing. Mm -hmm. um, I've got uh, a few poems, uh, and then I'd like to uh, show you some of the film work that I do. Uh, a few more poems from the collection uh, that uh, I think you might like. This is called, He Divides His Time Between. It's uh, only the third poem in the collection. He divides his time between is a line I always wanted in my bio. He divides his time between Reykjavik and Sandusky, Ohio. He summers on Lake Como and winters in Aspen. As it happens, no place is like home. Already I split my attentions between this world and any halfway decent poem. Doctors call it deficit, but some divisions make surpluses. We multiply when we divide our lives, our loves and our addresses.
Last year, I kept 40 plus pets. House sitting for strangers is as varied as it gets, dividing 12 months into 20 sits in 16 countries on five continents. I had a married life before in a subdivision of peace and war. In equal thirds, my loved ones ate my heart like a festival roast. Now my father's son is a ghost, a wisp of smoke, a metaphor. He divides his time between nothing and much and matters and any more. Uh, that poem that poem goes dark early in the collection because um, I really want uh, to also emphasize that this wasn't just a joy trip for me. It was a trip uh, that had a lot to do with recovery. Uh, I was at the end of a divorce. I was at the end of an estranged relationship. I was at the end of a, a lot of legal troubles, uh, all kinds of other problems. And um, I think I needed time and space. It was also 2018 uh, and we were in the middle of the Trump uh, uh, years and uh, that also uh, caused me um, a kind of schism uh, with my home country and my homeland that made me uh, want to experience the rest of the world. So this trip that I took was um, just as much a recovery trip as uh, anything else. I wanna share one more poem, uh, the next one from the collection and then, uh, and then we'll do some uh, film work. I do a lot of thinking about how uh, we live nowadays um, and how uh, bound we are by our homes and our places. This is called In Elaborate Museums. In elaborate museums on cul-de-sacs, curators of artifacts, keepers of grounds and statuary, security constabulary, feather dusting figurines, cars, boats, trampolines, temperature controlled garages, boudoirs fit for maharajas, <laughs> snap top plastic storage tubs stacked in rented storage hubs, albatrosses, ill afforded, hoarded, sorted and exported from their owner's mini mansions, waiting for their wing expansions. <laughs> I think we all got a dose of reality a little bit during the pandemic and we uh, had a chance to reevaluate um, our own homes uh, because we were bound to them uh, and our, our own communities because we were separated from them. Um, and a lot of the same kinds of themes that my book uh, touches on. Um, I traveled until the pandemic hit and then I had to return to the US and. Um, but, so I experienced the pandemic much like everyone did uh, once it started. Uh, I too was uh, homebound uh, on lockdown here in the United States. Uh, even though I had the um, freedom of uh, going month to month with my rentals, uh, I still had a lot of the same uh, kinds of limitations put on my activity. Um, I want to share a poem that I wrote about being on lockdown that was uh, that was adapted uh, into a film. Uh, Helen mentioned my uh, film work. My company, uh, Motion Poems, uh, was uh, 12 years running. We turned 150 uh, poems into films. Um, live action, animation, uh, public art, uh, lots of different types of filmmaking. Uh, you can find um, most of them on our Vimeo channel uh, if you look for Motion Poems. Uh, you know, on Vimeo. 
Um, I'm just going to share two today. One uh, is called On Lockdown, and it's a poem that uh, I happen to write. I don't like to um, insert myself into motion poems uh, work. I like to celebrate the poems of other poets. But um, during the lockdown, uh, this seemed particularly appropriate. So we just went ahead and, and made it. What we do is we invite poets to contribute poems to us. And then uh, each year I have a guest season producer whose job is to recruit filmmakers. Uh, every year that guest season producer is uh, a different uh, woman. Every year it's been a female. Uh, and she uh, has found um, us talents from all over the world. So there are filmmakers uh, who've contributed to uh, Motion Poems catalog from all over the world. This one uh, was made by uh, an Irishman uh, and you'll see the credits at the end. This is um, On Lockdown. On Lockdown, a week was a month and a month was cosmic. We aged like dogs age, I hoped, exponentially wiser. I missed the neons, but George Floyd's 846 stoked something older on an order more systemic that broke the fever of the pandemic and brought to light a darker and lonelier disease. We are more vulnerable by far than is realized by even our least sung furthest flung and most compromised. Every second now is eons. So the collection uh, goes dark uh, and it has its um, darker side, but I thought I'd shift up now and uh, give you some of the lighter, lighter poems from the collection. There are three in a row here that um, are, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not a big collector, so I don't, uh, I, I don't buy fridge magnets, uh, you know, uh, because I have no fridge. So um, what I end up doing is writing my own souvenirs. So the collection really are, it, it represents the only souvenir collection that I have from my travels. And uh, I wanna give you three of those uh, now. This is uh, written in Vienna, uh, workmen discarding a parquet floor. It's just an observation that I made on the street one day and it, and, it, and it turned out to be a meditation on place and home uh, and um, uh, and how things inevitably change. Into the dumpster goes someone's square feet. The racket royally rattles the street. It's a four-handed band performing the complete works of Beethoven using only wooden castanets in incomplete sets. What once a woman danced across. What once in a sash of sun, the cat snoozed afternoons upon. Unglued, unpatterned, going, gone. But first this tuneless, rhythmless outpouring of flooring into the bin, where once a couple just moved in, lay in sin, where once first steps a toddler took and fell. Maybe a spill 
made it swell and split. Maybe the new owners just don't fancy it. Well, it's dated, no doubt. So last century or the century before, it's out. Cue the two man crew who bent with bar of crow and barrowed wheel, go wall to wall to haul it all away. The next act in this play may play on other boards, but it better be better than whatever went before because loud and long is the floor's applause. Encore, encore, it calls. Mm. Nice. Uh, the collection is uh, beautifully illustrated, as I mentioned, but I just love the cover. Uh, so I thought I'd share that with you uh, here. It's uh, W.W. Norton does beautiful books. This will come out in January in hardcover. So wait for the paperback if you don't have the money for the, the real deal. But this is a, a beauty. Um, they uh, superimposed it on uh, some luggage. And then uh, deeper in, you can see the imprint of maps, town maps, uh, country maps on every, um, on every suitcase. Uh, they've just sort of overlaid the whole uh, photo with um, wonderful graphics. It's a poem called Why Empty Barbershops Draw Me, I Don't Know. I'm always, uh, uh, I don't know why uh, they stop me, but when I'm, where, wherever I am, uh, I love uh, a closed, uh, empty barbershop. It's romantic. I, I end up snapping photos through the windows. Chair convened there by chair by chair. Mirrored, clean. Someone the night before having swept up all the cut hair. Light streaming in from the street, printing whatever's on the plate glass, crooked across the floor. Closed sign askew in the door. We do want community, we, we do, but we also don't. We wanna be held close and left alone. We wanna talk when we wanna talk and we want sometimes instead to sit quietly while someone touches us all about the head with the edges of a scissoring scissor and the neat teeth of a comb. Small comfort, but lucky for us, the wealthy as well as the poor, that there are a few things left in this old world we still need other people for. I, uh, I wanna give you this one. It's called When the Sommelier Farts. Um, I have, um, kind of a unique practice in that I like to take private commissions. Uh, people will pay me a thousand dollars, something like that, to work with them on uh, something that is happening in their lives or some traumatic event they've uh, gone through or uh, celebrate a person uh, that they love uh, in a poetic way. Uh, I uh, work with them one-on-one -on -one, uh, through a series of phone conversations and take uh, pages and pages of notes. And then uh, I let my poetry mind find a way to make sense of what I've heard um, and uh, I distill it all down into some uh, observation or something that uh, makes a, a poem. Uh, and um, this is one of those poems. Uh, a man uh, came to me wanting to celebrate the life of a, of a, of a friend, another man uh, turning 50 and uh, give it as a gift on his 50th birthday. Uh, the man he wanted to celebrate uh, was uh, president of his Latin club, was now a lawyer, uh, but was kind of an iconoclast, uh, wears big bright clothing and uh, loved to celebrate wine and food and uh, uh, create big uh, gatherings, uh, lots and lots of parties, um, always meeting the chef at uh, restaurants, uh, just sort of a bigger than big personality, uh, full of life and joy. And so uh, I had to figure out a way after talking to many people 
uh, through the process who loved him, family members and friends, to, um, to find a humorous way, a joyous way uh, to bring all that uh, together. A wine connoisseur who uh, had a body sense of humor. So this is what I came up with. When the sommelier farts, he lifts his nose and blurts, I'm getting dried berry, flint, mocha notes, hints of honeydew melon and oak. And it's no joke, he actually is. Our arts are louder than our hearts. We wear them like iconoclasts wear clothes. The florists may be rose, but the same world passes through the sommelier's rose colored glasses. Your basic mud and grasses are in the ripe snuffle truffle. Some people don't see people, only people shaped graces. How they do it, heaven knows. Some arts are bigger, bolder, more fruit forward than others. That's just how it goes. The gustibus non est disputandum, which is to say, when farts the sommelier, it's just another big bouquet. And who'd have it any other way? <laughs> The gustibus non est disputandum uh, <laughs> is, is Latin for um, it's something like um, there's no accounting for taste. <laughs> and I had to uh, I had to approve that uh, with the um, with the man himself so that I knew I was getting the Latin the Latin right. So those are some of the lighter poems in the collection. Uh, um, and since we're on uh, lighter poems, I thought I'd give you another film. Uh, this one also uh, is made based on a poem of mine. Uh, it's an early poem. I think it appeared maybe in my second collection, uh, Pitch. It's a, a love poem, but it's kind of a complicated love poem. I'll tell you why after uh, the viewing. It's called, My Love For You Is So Embarrassingly. I was trying to, uh, you know, the trouble with love poetry is that it can sound so trite if you do it wrong. Uh, and uh, so I thought maybe the antidote to that would be to try to be as specific as I could about the particular love that I felt for my wife, my wife at the time. Uh, uh, and um, that brought me to this articulation. My love for you is so embarrassingly grand. Would you mind terribly, darling, if I compared it to the Hindenburg? I mean, before it burned. That vulnerable, elephantine dream of transport. A fabric titanic on an ocean of air. There, with binoculars, dear, you can just make me out in a gondola window, wildly flapping both arms as the ship's shadow moves like a vagrant country across the country where you live in relative safety. I pull that oblong shadow along behind me wherever I go. It is so big and goes so slowly. It alters ground temperatures noticeably, makes housewives part kitchen curtains, rings whimpers from German shepherds. Aren't I ridiculous? Isn't it anachronistic, this dirigible devotion, this zeppelin affection, a moon that touches with a kiss of wheels the ground you take for granted beneath your heels.
What right. was that music, Todd, in that one? Uh, you know, it's credited. I'm not sure. It's been some years. Okay. I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the filmmakers get all the rights to the music, so we're clear with all that. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay, if I continue, Joy? Yes. Uh, actually, uh, let me collect my thoughts a little bit more. Hey, uh, Helen. Uh, that poem, My Love for You, is so embarrassingly uh, sort of prescient on a number of levels. You know, uh, it, it attempted uh, to, to uh, articulate my love for my wife, but that relationship ended. Uh, and... Um, so that dirigible went down. Mm -hmm. uh, that Hindenburg uh, uh, burned. And um, yet, uh, on my travels, um, floating uh, beyond, so to speak, I, I do pull that shadow along behind me still. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's interesting to review that poem for me uh, all these years later. Uh, I've got uh, only two poems left uh, that I'd like to share. They're uh, also from the new collection, Someday the Plan of a Town. And uh, um, then I'll take some questions uh, and that'll be it for today. Cool. This was written on the coast of Australia. Um, it's a true story, uh, runaway bus. For a while, maybe a mile or more, a boy no more than four overhangs my seat so he can see my fingers on the keys of my laptop power away as we motor Highway 4 through Runaway Bay. And for that mile, I write for his amusement alone, highlighting a word and randomly replacing it, lumping whole lines and bumping them up and down the poem's column tracing and retracing a find and replace that turns all the ands into plus signs and back again. Riding my, rec my most reckless impulses like a surfer crushing madly into the barrel of a wave, knowing that if I don't hit save, I can undo the vandalism done. But then the kid and his dad get off the bus and my fun goes with them and so does my rhythm, so. I put the verse in reverse and watch as every stop flies past again, fast and faster, a bus barreling backward along its own coastal highway toward its own original disaster. And it all seems so unreal, my only passenger gone, that I let go the wheel and let it all be undone. The roadway, a rip curl of words going under till the run disappears and the sheet goes foam white, and I spill out onto the street and walk home, unwilling to write any more tonight. My mojo spent, the ocean still swelling, its epic grandly untelling itself into the sand. And I sleep like a man comfortably dead, route driven and heart red. And now to England, where I had this experience uh, in St. Martin's Church. Nine Voices at St. Martin's. I am not a believer, nor do I believe in disbelief. I'm not too proud for anything, and neither facts nor fictions frighten me. I'm comfortable holding a stranger's gaze. And I often feel God or something godly gazing back. My life is full of the usual urgent, necessary and unnecessary distractions. But yesterday in London with a friend, I descended into the crypt cafe and then wandered upward into St. Martin's where a choir of nine was not so much singing as 
releasing birds of hymnody into the airy sanctuary, lilting flocks of wingy sounds. And by the time they finally began and abide with me, I was open weeping in my row, my friend kindly nesting my hand. And the world took on that forest glade glow it gets when you know beauty may be found. And suddenly this simple, sturdy, clear windowed temple with its weather vane steeple was my favorite of all Europe's showy churches. And London's people seemed the finest people. And it didn't seem at all odd to find myself here that there should be a God or that God, whether soul or energy or light might be right there abiding in the patterns of voices in mid flight or the patter of rain on Duncannon Street. I mopped my face with my pocket square and stuffed it back away and wanted more, would have stayed all day, but one more tune and they were done, and filed away behind the altar where no doubt they folded their books and packed their packs and bloomed their umbrellas into the afternoon and crossed into the underground and queued ordinarily for the train. If I passed one going home, I didn't recognize, I didn't know to praise them for my open ears, my opened eyes, the music my own train made as it wheeled, the colors of the sky, the brick towns passing by, the trees on the ridge line, and the horses in the field. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Todd, was that, uh, is that St. Martin's in the field? Is that the one that, that little church? Uh, Saint, no, it's uh, St. Martin's uh, right uh, next to the portrait gallery right downtown. In, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's St. Martin's in the field. Martin's and, the field. Uh, it's yeah. that Christopher Wren church. And it, That's it, right. uh, it is a magical place. Wow. Yeah, beautiful poem. Thank you. That is a that is a wonderful poem. I loved both of those last two poems that you read. Todd, what a terrific reading. Um, loved hearing the poems, loved seeing the films. Uh, there's there's just so much to, to talk about with um, with watching you and, and listening to you. And so let's segue now into the, the Q&A. Um, I want to start by hearing a little bit more, if I may, about uh, about motion poems. I'm curious. Um, and you, you may have said this, but I don't believe you did. I know you've done about 150 motion poems and I'm wondering about how many you typically would do a year and sort of, you told us a little bit about the process. Um, uh, you have people who you've invited, poets you've invited to send you poems and then you comb through them or do you have editors who do that for you? Can you just, just talk a little bit more about the process for us, about how it goes from for soliciting poems to the final product, including um, where they then show up and how they're yeah. paid for and the whole the whole deal. Yeah, yes. okay, wow, well, that's a lot. So uh, <laughs> let's, let's see, um, uh, you know, as a poet myself, I'm um, uh, really conscious of uh, um, uh, being careful about rights. Uh, so the whole process begins with a contract that um, uh, secures everyone's rights to their own work. So poets uh, aren't being um, taken advantage of, filmmakers aren't uh, being taken advantage of, everyone can use the work uh, uh, to, to enhance their own careers or screen it or show it uh, as they wish. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, basically we, um, every year we try to reinvent the model. So it's, a, a, it's complicated to answer your question. Um, we have, for example, partnered one year or two years in a row with Best American Poetry, the anthology, mm -hmm. uh, and only taken uh, poems from that collection. Uh, another year, I think we partnered with five or six different publishers and just asked them to give us poems that they thought would be, uh, would make great motion poems. Uh, other years we've done open calls and invited poems, poets to uh, submit uh, work to us. So we're always kind of tweaking uh, how we do that. But uh, when it comes time to recruit filmmakers, uh, really what our guest season producer does is 
uh, shovel uh, handfuls, uh, maybe five or 10 at a time, poems uh, out to filmmakers that she uh, is excited about. Um, the filmmaker will read through what they've been given. Uh, and if nothing rings their bells, they'll ask for more and we'll keep shoveling. Uh, and um, the goal there is to um, not match make our, you know, we're not matchmaking poets to filmmakers and we're not matching uh, poems uh, to filmmakers. We're really allowing filmmakers to read and fall in love. Uh, the, the, the idea is to really find something that resonates with the filmmaker so that they um, can invest in it as an artwork that's uh, significant to them and to their, their style and their, their way of working. And that's worked really well for us. Once that uh, match has been made, so to speak, we uh, introduce the poet to the filmmaker so that they have a chance uh, to humanize uh, one another a little bit and discuss the work. And um, I, during that process, I always, uh, I tend to facilitate those meetings. I always uh, make a point of uh, letting everyone know that at that point, uh, there's a shift. Uh, the poem really becomes the property of the filmmaker uh, for a time. Uh, the filmmaker has complete creative control. We don't direct, uh, we don't tell them what we think the poem is about. We don't, uh, we invite the poet to talk about the poem, but we make sure that it's clear to everyone that the filmmaker is at liberty to dispense uh, with whatever the poet might say and interpret the poem in any way they, 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 they might. So that creative control is really important to us, uh, giving that over to the filmmaker and making sure everyone at the table is com uh, comfortable uh, with that uh, premise. And then um, the filmmaker goes to work. Uh, uh, maybe three months later, six months later, we see a film. Uh, we share it with the poet. That doesn't always go terribly well. Uh -oh. <laughs> a poet uh, uh, by that time has also been warned by me that they may not like uh, the finished film. That's of no concern to us. Mm -hmm. uh, and I make that clear to them as well. And um, they're always on board. Uh, sometimes a film comes back with an edge or a style or a point of view that's just not what the poet could ever have imagined. And of course, that's part of the point, right? Mm. But it always, it only just takes a few viewings or sharing it with friends or seeing it on the big screen uh, before they uh, are back in love with the work. Uh, seeing it through that other point of view um, takes some time. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, what do we do with the films? They go to film festivals, they win uh, uh, slots and awards uh, all over the world. We've been uh, nominated best director at uh, Cannes. Um, we showcase them every year with a big public premiere of our work. We do 12 or so films a year. Um, and then they go on our archive uh, on Vimeo or at motionpoems.org. And is it usually the poet reading the poem or not necessarily? No, in fact, um, you know, my, my sense of poetry readings and I've been to my share uh, is that uh, poets aren't always the best readers of their own work. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, no disrespect. Uh, I think there's no real shame in saying it. And I don't think um, it's a surprise really to anyone uh, hearing it. Uh, poets just aren't trained. Uh, as, as thespians or, or, uh, or, uh, or to present their work powerfully. And um, that's a shame. I, I'd, I'd like to figure out how to, how to fix that. Mm -hmm. um, and filmmakers uh, come with a different set of expectations about what a voice has to do in a film. The work of a voiceover artist is very different uh, than the work of a poet reading uh, at a microphone. Um, Sometimes professional voiceover actors are hired 
uh, sometimes a filmmaker will ask their mother or uh, some non-professional person that they know has the right timbre or has the right age quality or has the right uh, accent uh, for a voice. Um, very rarely in our films does the poet actually do the voiceover. Interesting, yeah. Even you, your poems were not read by you? They were, those two were. Uh, oh, okay. They didn't, they they were presented to the filmmakers as options to use, and in in both cases, the filmmakers yeah. used. Them. Okay, good, good, yeah, and and they were terrific. I mean, you did such a good job reading them. I thought I heard your voice. That's why I, I wondered. Yeah, well, that is all just fascinating. And um, and how do you um, how, how do you raise the funds for a project like any individual film, poem film? Well, uh, that's changed as well. Um, Motion Poems, as I said, was a nonprofit uh, arts organization for about 12 years. And in about a year and a half ago, uh, the board voted to close it down as a nonprofit. So it doesn't exist anymore as an organization, but it's still, but it's still part of my private practice. Uh, okay. So I don't really raise funds for Motion Poems anymore, but uh, the model has shifted uh, a little bit. Uh, if you watch the credits after that, uh, on lockdown film, you may have noticed that it was commissioned by uh, the Center for the Art of Medicine at the University of Minnesota's Medical School. Uh, and that's a new model where we're um, partnering with major institutions or organizations like that um, to figure out how poetry and filmmaking can address issues that they want to address without doing it in the you know more traditional ways. Yeah, yeah, terrific. No, that's all fascinating, and and good luck with that. I ho I hope you continue to make those. I think they're really wonderful. Me too. Um, thank you. You know, and they're coming at culture in a different way. I think I think a lot of people will be drawn to poetry um, as a result of watching. Um, those film clips. So, uh, we have a question that came in. Are you able to see it on the screen, or would you? Or, I can, yeah. 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 Do you want me to read it out loud? Yeah, why don't you read it out loud and then, yeah, then you can answer it. Uh, it says, uh, Todd, you presented the poems in an unusual and generous way, allowing both the auditory experience and the visual one of seeing the print on the page. I found it enriching and actually made the poem more fully delivered. I usually have to hear a poem twice to even start to get at its pleasures, this delivered all at once. How did you discover this? What might it lead to for yourself or even others? I love that question. And uh, uh, this is the first time that I've been able to uh, figure out how to screen share uh, um, uh, confidently enough to be able to read that way uh, in a Zoom presentation. Um, when I read in public, I like to request uh, uh, transparency uh, and, I, and I come prepared with a transparency or I hook up my laptop so that everything can be shown. Uh, I, I really think that, uh, as I said about poets not being the best readers of their own work, um, po poetry, um, poetry's roots are as an oral art form. We once read, uh, recited work um, around the fire or uh, you know, at the pub over beers and uh, the whole idea was that it was an auditory experience. Um, literature kind of corrupted, uh, uh, print kind of corrupted that uh, tradition and turned poetry into a literature. Um, and now we look at it instead of listen to it and we read it uh, instead of uh, share it orally. And um, so by doing both, I, I like to celebrate both. I also, think of poems as very sculptural. You know, the way they look on the page is uh, shapely and uh, intentional and exists in a kind of white space that um, sets the poem off. And so uh, when a poem is simply read out loud, you don't get to, right. you don't get to walk around it like you would a sculpture in space. And so, um, yeah, I really want to give you the whole, try to give you the whole experience. Thanks for the question. Yeah. No, that's, um... I've noticed with many of your poems, um, and this is a good, a good place to talk about this, you have used the shorter lines, um, you use so much wonderful internal rhyme. I know from reading a couple of, 
I think maybe a couple of earlier interviews that you did, you've, you're have you compared often to Kay Ryan um, for the shapes of your poems um, and also um, Gerard Manley Hopkins, which is pretty cool. So um, uh, could you talk a little bit about that, you know, how you choose? It looked to me when I saw the poems from your new book, the book that's coming out, which by the way, um, those of you who are tuning in, please order Todd's new book um, and tombelowbooks.com. Um, Alsace Valentine stands ready to order the books for you. And uh, we would love for you to do that. Um, and But but it, could, it looked to me like the poems that you showed from your new book, some of the lines were a little bit longer. I even saw one that one of them, let's see, which one was it? The uh, Maybe the title poem, or was it the one about the bus that almost looks like a prose poem? Even though you still have, you know, your wonderful internal rhyme woven all the way through, the sound work is still happening. Um, but it looks to me like there's a, uh, maybe a little bit of a shift from your earlier books, um, or was it just those particular poems? Could you talk uh, about it? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'm kind of all over the map with all of my books, uh, but you're right. My shift a little bit has been over the years from shorter lines to longer ones, and my next uh my next project uh, after Someday the Plan of a Town uh, is um, even longer, longer lines and uh, sort of deeper uh, plunge into that, into that direction. But um, I don't know how to answer that exactly. Uh, every poem uh, seems to want a different kind of treatment. Uh, that poem, Runaway Bus, uh, indeed uh, probably had the longest lines of anything that I read today. And um, I think it's because a bus is long, a coastal highway is long. Um, the story itself is a little bit longer in the telling. Um, yeah, I, I kind of just wanted to feel that in the lines. You know? Yeah. Um, but you're right, my, my impulse tends to be toward a very short sort of jaunty uh, lots and lots of line breaks, lots and lots of play on the paper. And uh, I think it's mostly just because I want my poems to feel playful and, um, and, and like they're trying themselves on for the first time. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And even your points that, you know, that lead a little darker. Um, I've noticed you still are able to give a similar sort of format. And again, that, that wonderful internal rhyme, uh, the sound work with even your poems that go a little bit darker. So um, I know sometimes too much rhyme can give a sort of levity to poems, um, but I never, I don't feel that from your poems. Um, and I think it's because you handle rhyme so well um, and especially the way that you embed it within your lines. Yeah, um, you know, rhyme is a suspicious activity. Uh, we we're 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 right to be suspicious of it. Every Hallmark card that we've ever gotten, um, you know, they, we're 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 right to be suspicious of sort of trite end rhymes, uh, the expected end rhyme. Um, uh, it, it it just rings of of uh, of um, it's too simple, too easy. Uh, and so my way of getting around that and still celebrating the sounds that I want to celebrate in poetry is to tuck those rhymes into places where you wouldn't expect them or uh, break the rhythms uh, so that they appear where you, your ear isn't uh, ready for them. And that way, that way um, they're not as suspicious as they might ordinarily be. Right, right. Your use of enjambment. Um, is working all the way through. And, and of course your off rhymes, your, your slant rhymes as well. So, yeah. Um, well, I think, unfortunately that's probably all we have time for. And I'm, I'm sorry, I would love for us to have this conversation um, for, for much longer, but it has been a pleasure to have you join us for the Dolly Poetry Series. And um, please know that the next time you're around here, we want you to come visit the museum um, and be our, be our guest. And um, it'll be great to see you there. And please let us know also when you have more films coming out. I'd love to know about them. And um, thank you so much for your, good, for your good work. And thanks to all of you all for tuning in to the Dolly Poetry Series uh, this evening. Thank you, Helen. My, um, 
experience at the Dali last time was top notch. My memories of St. Petersburg are are, uh, are precious to me. Uh, I, I, I was grateful for your hosting and for Hank's uh, dinner at his house. And uh, I will be back. Uh, but, it yes. is a, it's a beautiful museum you have there. Thank you so much for having me. We'll look forward to seeing you. Thanks, everybody. Good night.